Freddie did write me an introduction, but I'm not going to use her introduction. Uh, and I'll, you'll, you'll figure out why in a second, because I, I, there's just so much I have to say about Freddie. The first time I met Freddie was at a Toastmasters event, and she was just the kindest. Just she had the best energy in, in the room that, that I have seen in a long time. At the time, I didn't know who she was. Later on, I came to find out that she's a part of what I call Toastmasters Navy SEAL Team 6. And if you don't know what that means, it's a very small group of Toastmasters who have attained the designation of accredited speaker. And I don't know, there's a handful of them around the entire world. And it's a very rigorous process. They go through tons of vettings and, 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 and it's just a lot of work. And at the end of the day, they are granted this accredited speaker status, and it's as good as any professional speaker badge that you can wear. So we are in the, we are in the presence of somebody really special, really valuable to this organization, Freddie Dogtron. And she's going to be talking to us, talking to us about failing forward um, into the art of success. Now, she's experienced failures in her life, quite a few, and she wants to share with you how to turn those failures around into successes. I've gone on long enough. I think you should hear from her next. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Freddie Dogtrom, Failing Forward, The Art of Success. Failing Forward, The Art of Success, Freddie Dogtrom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I am indeed am an expert in the science of failure. I have probably failed as much, if not more, than anybody. I've failed on a personal level. I have failed on a professional level. And I've definitely failed on the Toastmaster level. You know, I remember my first disappointment. I was about four years old. And I was the littlest angel in the Christmas pageant. And I was so ticked off because I was the only one that didn't have real feathers on my wings. I had these crummy little crepe paper wings and I was really disappointed. And it was my loving big brother that pointed out and told me, he says, well, you're not a real angel anyhow. And you know, that thought that I'm not a real angel anyhow has stayed with me forever. But let's take a look at failure. I know you failed, I failed. But what do we do with those failures? I am an expert at the process. Sometimes when we're looking at personal failures, we really view it as being part of what I like to call the fatal phase where we take failure and we use it to stop dead in our tracks. That is where we can quit. I know that some of you have heard some of my Arctic stories and I was talking in Georgia earlier this week and I was telling about one of my ice road trucker stories and the events that caused me to quit or to stop that career. You know, it was that occasion that really drove me to think about this whole science of failure. Is it something that we need to make our tracks stop dead in the snow about? I don't think so. You see, then I decided that I wanted to become a professional speaker. That's probably one of the most difficult professions in the world. You see, I joined Toastmasters when I was already a paid professional speaker because I liked what the program had to offer. I wanted more tools in my toolbox and I wanted a safe supported environment so that I could practice my tools, practice my material and get really good feedback, which is exactly what you get in Toastmasters. But as a professional speaker, you are the product. And every time you respond to somebody's request to have you come and speak, you are putting yourself out on the line. And sometimes you look at a request for proposal because the big conferences, they send out the RFP or the request for proposal. And so you have to put all of your information in, send it away, and then 
they determine whether they want you or not. And because it's a very personal field, it can be debilitating not to be chosen to speak at the conference. But it was through Toastmasters that I learned that, you know, you look, you apply, you get refused, that's okay. The sun is still going to come up another day because failure isn't fatal, especially if you use it as a springboard for learning and for getting on with your life. I know many of you, like me, have entered speech contests. Oh, I love speech contests. Absolutely love them because this is how you can really get good. If you're wondering whether or not you should enter your club contest during the next round, do it. Absolutely do it because that is one of the guaranteed ways that you can take your speaking craft up to the next level. It doesn't matter if you win. It doesn't matter if you play. By entering, you will be a winner because you will come out better than you went in. Actually, I attended a speech contest before I even became a Toastmaster. I wanted to check this organization out. I had gone to a meeting of a club that was just trying to charter and they'd ask me some questions. I later learned it was table topic. And I responded. And the evaluation was not an evaluation of my skill. It was a character assassination of my answer. And I was really quite put off. So just think about in your meeting, how is your evaluation process? Is it uplifting? Is it there to help the people to really do better? Are you leading with your heart when you're doing evaluations? I sure hope so, because I wouldn't want anybody else to have that experience. So I went to a contest. Now, I had heard about Toastmasters over the years. My dad had some friends that were Toastmasters, and this is something I, I really wanted to do. I went to the contest. And I met some absolutely delightful people that were in my immediate area. Well, little did I know that when I walked in and sort of looked around blankly and I said, can I help? <laughs> they put me at the door signing people in. So I got to meet everybody that came in. What a wonderful introduction to Toastmasters. And I watched the contest and I thought, Oh, I like this because I'm just a little bit competitive. So I signed up and said, yes, this is what I want to do and got on to the program. Well, contest season came around. Now, sometimes we can get just a little bit cocky. I know I certainly can. So when contest season rolled around, I thought, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to enter the contest. And I did, and it was great. We had a small club and I won at the club level because I was the only competitor. And off I went to the area level where I did not succeed. I'm going like, hmm, how come I didn't win at the area level? I mean, I was as good as that person that won. But rather than be bitter, I decided I'm gonna get better. And so I started to use the power of the club, and I hope you do that as well. 2005 turned out to be a really good year for me because I had learned a lot and gained a lot of support from my club members, and I became the District 42 Evaluation and Table Topics champion that year. 05, that was a really good year. But then in 08, 08 came along. And I entered, and I was in the district evaluation contest. Now, those of you that have been in contests, I think you kind of know what I'm going to be saying here. So I listened to the test speaker, who was really quite a good speaker. And I got my evaluation all ready. And then when it was my turn, I delivered it, and I thought I did just an absolute amazing job. And then the drum roll. They are going to announce the winners. In third place, not my name. Second place, not my name. So I took all of the papers and things off my lap 
and I put them on the floor because I knew, I knew they were going to call my name. Can I have the drum roll, please? And they didn't announce my name. I had failed. Thought, oh my gosh, what happened? So once again, rather than using the failure as an opportunity to beat myself up, I thought, no, I have to learn from this. And so I started talking to people and getting feedback and became much, much better at evaluation. And that's the cool thing that speech contests can do. It doesn't matter if you win, although it is nice. I got to say it's nice. It doesn't matter if you win. It's what do you learn through the process? Oh, 20, was it 2018? It was so cool, so amazing, so wonderful. Because I got to go to the Division International Speech Contest. And I had a pretty good speech. And I worked on it. And I tapped into my club and got feedback. Gave my speech. And wouldn't you know it, not only did I go a couple seconds over, I timed myself out at 17 seconds over. Oh, <laughs> what an embarrassment. What a failure. I'm supposed to be able to have this little clock in my head where I can figure this out, but I had completely blown it in front of my peers. It was a failure. You see, sometimes there's a physical part of failure. Sometimes there's an intellectual part of failure. Sometimes there's an emotional component. And sometimes if you blow it big enough, all three elements are there. But how do you take these experiences and don't fail backwards, but fail forward? You know, some of you have been with me on my accredited speaker journey. And thank you, Anthony, for mentioning that. There are 88 accredited speakers in the world since 1981. 14 of them are women. Four of them are Canadian women. And I get to be one of those, which is kind of fun. But it is a difficult process. And some of you have walked with me. In 2015, actually it started, actually I started the process in 2004. I sent in the application at level one, there's two levels of judging, and was told that I did not qualify. So I worked really hard on developing my skills and sent it in again in 2014. You have to send in either an audio tape or a videotape and it gets judged by a panel of your peers. And then you get the feedback that says you either passed or failed. But unlike a speech contest, you actually get feedback. So you take a look at the feedback and go like, okay, this is what I need to work on. This is what I need to work on. So you see the failure aspect of it can also be very constructive and instructive. But in 2014, I got the letter that said, hey, you have passed level one. You are now eligible to speak at an international convention to attempt your passing of level two. So the first one is where you send in an audio or videotape, get judged. The second level is where you perform live in front of the world. Wow, this was so exciting. This was in Las Vegas, Caesars Palace. And they had this humongous stage. It was absolutely amazing. And so during the practice sessions, when we got to go in and walk the stage, I mean, you almost had to pack a lunch to get from one side of the stage to the other. It was so huge, but it was awesome. And so I delivered what, I thought was an excellent speech. It was one of the keynotes that I'd been giving and it was about um, the Anukshuk and how we can build our lives one stone at a time through one relationship at a time. At the end of the speech, I felt like Celine Dion because everybody rushed the stage. It wasn't for me, it was for my Anukshuk. They wanted to have their picture taken with the Anukshuk. The speech itself was an absolute crowd pleaser. Many, many people liked it and I got lots of really nice feedback and comments on it. 
but way in the back, there was one person sitting there who was my, my cheerleader, my coach, a member of my home club. And after everything settled down, I went and sat beside my coach and he said, so how did you feel about that speech? I says, well, says it took me a while to find my feet because I changed the first 10 minutes of it last night. I had got some coaching and some support from some really great, well-meaning people, and they had encouraged me to change that first 10 minutes. Well, I'd stayed up all night practicing, but it just didn't flow. And it was only when I got into the flow of my speech that things started to come together. That year, how they let us know if we passed or failed is that when the judges were sequestered and they made the determination, a staff member from Toastmasters International would phone you and let you know if you passed or failed. But the results were not going to be announced until the next day, just before the world champion of public speaking. So here I am walking down the hallway of flags and my phone goes, and the very nice lady on the phone says, Freddie, thank you for giving us your presentation today. The judges have determined that you were not successful, but we invite you to try again another time. There is nothing like failing in front of the world. So I went to my room because I had to change my shoes. My shoes were pinching. And ladies, you know that we've got shoes for walking and we've got shoes for talking. Well, I had to get out of my talking shoes and get into my walking shoes, but that was very beneficial because here's one of the big lessons that I learned about failing is that you need to give yourself some time to process the emotion. So I went up to my room and I processed the disappointment and the feeling I had of failure and and just everything that was going on through my mind. I texted my husband and I said, don't bother putting the champagne on ice. The worst part though, was when I went back down and you know through the different events, people were coming up to me and they were saying, oh man, Freddie, I love that. That was a great speech. You nailed it, you got it. But I knew that I had not, but I couldn't do anything about it. So the next day when they announced, they said, we have had three presentations for the accredited speaker, and we have one new accredited speaker. And all these eyes turned and looked at me, like thumbs up, yeah, Freddie, we knew you made it. And they announced a different name. Wow, talking about putting yourself out there. But what a wonderful lesson, because at that moment in time, I realized that the best thing that could have happened to me was that failure. Because it was that failure that I was able to use as a launching pad, as a springboard, as that motivation to get in there and get better. Don't get bitter, don't go home, don't quit, get better. Now I had initially intended on going to Chicago the following year, but then in 2017, the convention, the international convention was gonna be in Vancouver and I thought, you know, I'm a Canadian. I want to get this in Canada, and that gives me two years to get ready. So what I did was I knuckled down and started to work. I crafted a keynote specifically for the International Convention, specifically for the accredited speaker presentation. I really knuckled down and worked at it. And here's what was amazing. The Toastmaster family, my home club, were absolutely amazing. I would bring pieces of the speech to a meeting, deliver it, and get their feedback. And I'd bring another speech, a piece of the speech and get their feedback. Then at the um, District 42 Spring Convention of that year, they allowed me some time on Friday night to deliver my speech and get some high level feedback from the people at the convention. You can't say enough good things about Toastmasters because my friends, they will be there for you. 
It is absolutely amazing. So based on their feedback, I then started really polishing up. I had two months to polish up. Now, here's something to think about. Any of you that are wanting to become a professional speaker or to you know, take a look at the accredited speaker program, even your club speeches, one of the most important elements is your introduction. I know it's so tempting that when you're giving a speech at the club, you just sort of like blah, 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 cobble something together. I'm working on this project. It's this level. It's you know, this pathway. Who cares? Nobody cares. But what you need to do is you need to have that really good introduction that is going to set the stage for your audience. So you want the stage set. And I really worked hard on my introduction. I had it professionally voiced over and had it crafted into a PowerPoint slideshow so that the person reading the introduction could not mess it up. I took complete control of it and Margaret Page just went, here's Freddie and there was my introduction. And I launched into my presentation. Your retirement prescription, it takes more than money. You can catch it on YouTube. But it was amazing. I felt so good up there on the stage. I didn't stumble, didn't have these other experiences, you know, from 2015. And when 6,000 eyeballs are looking at you, you really want to bring your A game. But here's another thing that I had learned from my initial failure. When you're standing on a huge stage, and for those of you that have gone to the semifinals or the finals of the world champion public speaking, you know what I'm going to say. When you're standing on this huge stage, there is so much electronic noise in front of you from monitors and speakers and this and that. You can't hear the audience. So if you're depending on the <gasps> gasp or the oh or the whatever from the audience or the little chuckles, you can't hear them. So it's really hard to draw on that feedback as you're moving ahead. I was delighted that in 2017, I was awarded the accredited speaker designation. And all of a sudden, this became my favorite jewelry, my accredited speaker badge. <laughs> but I could not have done it without the love and support and encouragement of my home club, my area, my area directors, Division D, I mean, they are absolutely amazing. Another element of failure in my life has been using the Toastmaster program. My home club is dynamically speaking. We've been around for 22 years. In those 22 years, we have had 17 years as the President Select Club. Amazing. We had one year in that time where we were distinguished only. That was the year I was president. I was president the only year that we didn't make it. Now, why was that? I failed to use the program. You know, the Distinguished Club program? I knew about it, but I just chose not to use it. What a goofy mistake because you see that led to the failure because the club had the potential to make it at the president's distinguished. As a leader, I failed the club when I didn't use the program. So any of you that have access to your distinguished club program, really take a look at it and use it. Because the great thing about it is that it supports your members. I mean, what are our clubs about? That's about our members and our members succeeding. We just don't want our members to become experts in the fa failure process. Although, you know, they're gonna have some ups and downs and we need to help them to fail forward rather than failing to quit. But the Distinguished Club program works with the individual member's goals. That's amazing. It also helps us with our administration because any organization has to do the behind the scenes work. 
And it also shows us and encourages us how to get new members. I have to say that I really like this Zoom environment. I'm not crazy about the virus, but I'm loving the Zoom environment because now we can take our blinkers off and go all around the world. Two weeks ago, I was speaking in Malaysia. How amazing is that? Kuala Lumpur, District 102. It was amazing. They had speakers from all over the world. Last week, I was speaking in Georgia to an international speechathon. We had speakers from India, from France, from Mexico, from Canada, and the US. It was absolutely amazing. So, thinking about this environment that we're in now, rather than saying, oh, I don't know what we can do, we can't meet in person, and I guess our club's just going to have to pack up its banner and go home. What can we do? What opportunities are there for our clubs to think outside of the box or outside of the screen? So thinking about your distinguished club program, as well as the amazing opportunities that Zoom has for us, this is going to give us truly the opportunity as individual Toastmasters, as club executives, area leaders, and division leaders to absolutely fail forward because we're not going to let this little hiccup get us down because we're Toastmasters. And we can take a look at the dynamics of change and of leadership, the lessons learned from, from failing because most of us will have some opportunity for failure. To take a look at the physics, you know, like what happens when we have these disappointing experiences, but to always, always, always draw on our support, on our club members, on our coaches, on our mentors, and always fail forward. Because we know that our clubs, our areas, our divisions, and our districts are absolutely there for us. Back to you, Anthony.